Welcome to our talk, Can Sustainability and Fashion Go Hand in Hand? The fashion industry, as we heard already, is one of the most resource-intensive industries in the world and emissions from textile production will rise dramatically within the next few years. How do we move beyond the climate impact? How do brands, uh, are brands investing efficiently enough in circular systems, smart material choices and respectful work environments? Do they live up to their commitments? Everyone has to find <coughs> solutions to move forward. I'm happy to have four expert here, experts here on the panel who will shine a light on the relationship of fashion and sustainability from very different angles. So welcome with me here virtually, she is joining me virtually, Katrin Lai, the Managing Director of Fashion for Good, an innovation platform and research and development lab for supporting companies like Otto, Adidas, Salando, and the Caring Group, based in Amsterdam. Catherine has worked many years as a consultant and managing director for Adidas before joining Fashion for Good. She says, we need a lot of money and support to implement new solutions and ideas to the fashion business. Also here virtually, um, Jonas Eder Hansen, he has worked with sustainability since 2002 when I couldn't even pronounce the word properly. Um, he was development director at F Danish Fashion Institute and joined the Global Fashion Agenda 10 years ago. The Fashion Agenda is the leadership forum for industry collaborations on sustainability in fashion. As public affairs director, he talks with decision and policy makers, as well as stakeholders, to secure increased sustainable impact in the fashion industry. So you can imagine he talks a lot. You can call him a lobbyist, and although his mission is rather a revolution, he says he's an optimist. Tina Lutz, here with me in the studio, she studied fashion design in Paris, worked for Issey Miyake in Tokyo and for Calvin Klein in New York, before she co-founded her own luxury knitwear label. Four years ago, she started Lutz Morris, a label for timeless handbags made in Germany. She's an advocate for slow fashion and giving back. Last year, she won the Sustainability Award of the Fashion Group International in New York, but she says new products inevitab inevitably leave a footprint. Um, so that's why she calls her production responsible rather than sustainable. And last but not least, Markus Learning. He was for many years for the FDP in the Bundestag and from 2010 to 14, Federal Government Commissioner for Human Rights Policy. In his capacity, he traveled 70 countries in Europe, Africa, Asia and the US, visited refugee camps and helped free a few prisoners, especially from China. Human rights, including fair working conditions, are his life's work. A good 10 years ago, he founded the human rights and responsibility business and con a consulting company and think tank for medium-sized companies. Among other industries, he also advises large textile companies and he says, the respect for human rights is now part mm -hmm. of a forward-looking corporate strategy. Mr. Learning. You have been campaigning for fair working conditions for decades. After all that happened recently in Myanmar or with the Uyghurs, or even with um, undemocratic, uh, or badly paid um, workers in Los Angeles or Leicester, has your, uh, has your work been in vain so far? Absolutely not. Because uh, if I wasn't uh, an optimist, you know, I could stop working tomorrow and we could all stop working because I think it's a long road that we're, we're walking on and it, the goals are far. We see progress, we see setbacks, but we should never give up. We should move forward, especially if we believe in a, in a free world where people have their rights, they're being respected. If we believe in a world where exchange can take place, 
exchange of ideas, exchange of people, of goods, of design. So I think that's the way forward and we need to strive for improvement. Everybody in the value chain should have their fair share. It's not a good idea that you know, we buy nice clothes and those that manufacture actually don't have their fair share. That's something we need to change. And if I look at the garment industry overall, I see a major shift really in the awareness of people. And I see steps towards change, which is different. Some, countries, uh, some companies are more ahead than others. But I see that the whole industry is debating the topic. And just the fact that today we're debating that is another proof of that. So you're never frustrated, you're never in despair when you know you hear this. I mean, just of recently. Of course I am. Of course I am. I mean, if I think of the situation in Xinjiang, if I think of the uh, situation in Myanmar, which is very dear to my heart, because I was there when the prisons were open ten years ago, and the people that I could, you know, meet, that were, have been in prison, are back in prison now. That, of course, that breaks my heart. But I also see that. Progress is being made in other stages. And I saw 10 years of progress also even in Myanmar. And I very much hope, of course, that my friends can be released from prison soon again. And I don't think it's a good idea for the industry, for example, to completely disengage from such a country. We should stay as long as it's possible, as long as it's feasible, make sure we don't feed the military. So make sure we have independent suppliers there. That's possible to some extent. So let's behave responsible there too. The collapse of Rana Plaza in 2013 was kind of a turning point. That's what we all agree on. And um, workers, that's what you know, people think, became more visible. I was wondering when the crisis hit us, many workers, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, lost their jobs. They're now coming back. I suppose, but are they coming back to uh, more secure work environments, really? Or is it just lip service? Some of them are. We have an ongoing project, for example, with the uh, with industry in Sri Lanka at the moment. And companies in Sri Lanka understand that if they want to have access to the European single market, they're also to the US, they need to meet the sustainability standard. They see it as a competitive advantage, so it's an economic advantage they have in treating their workers right, in paying them what they should be paid. So there's a change there also on the supplier side that is taking place. Not everywhere, not in the pace that I would wish it would be happening, but I can see change taking place. And on the other side, I see the European fashion industry changing their supply chain and their relations with suppliers, reducing the numbers, giving more uh, security to their suppliers and saying, OK, you will have work next year. We'll make sure you get your payment in time. There will be bigger volumes we will, uh, we will have with you. So there's a change taking place. And I overall see it as a, as a positive change. Obviously, you know, nobody was ready for COVID. So that uh, will change a lot. But the, the, pressure, the pressure on European companies to be sustainable is so much higher now. Consumers are demanding, lawmakers are demanding it, public attention is there, so there's no way they can escape uh, the pressure to be more sustainable. I hope you are, you're right. Uh, we were talking about the new European Bauhaus earlier. Um, and to what extent do you think makes does this initiative make a difference, not only for European suppliers or brands, as you, as you just said, mm -hmm. but maybe worldwide well, for artisans? I think there's, there's two ideas in there that I, I, I very much like. One idea is that Bauhaus was all about making good products available for a lot of people that don't have that much money. And I think that's important. It's a very important idea. Give people quality and make sure that they can afford it. So there's a social core to Bauhaus, which was then in architecture and, and uh, furniture, but now you take it to fashion or to anything else. So that's a very good idea. Secondly, 
this idea of the Euro new European Bauhaus also means moving from dystopia, moving from, you know, this, the horrible things that are happening to a positive vision. What is it we actually want as Europeans? How do we want supply chains to be organized in a decade from now? So create a positive vision of that because it's good to have a free and open world. So we should make sure that everybody sees a, a benefit in that. So I think it's a good step to take and it's good to move away from this negative thinking towards a more positive thinking. You know, incentivize people to move forward. Tina, what do you think? You work with, I mean, basically you live the new European Bauhaus idea after working for big brands earlier and you now have your own um, label that you control that you can control to the last uh, end of uh, the supply chain you work with artisans you found all these artisans in Germany um, what is your experience can the support of artisans uh, or can this initiative uh, initiative make a difference in building a better world I, I, I hope so. <laughs> um, well, I have to go a little bit further back because um, I spent almost half my year in New York and I had my ready-to-wear brand there. And um, so in 2008, after the crash, um, there was a huge movement for made in New York, made in the US, and all the designers on the East and West Coast were getting together and... Um, with the CFDA, the Council of Fashion Designer of America, and was creating these programs to support local manufacturing. Um, it, it, politicians joined, it was um, backed by Obama, and um, it was very much in this American spirit, like roll up your sleeve and just get it done. Um, so there were a lot of manufacturers who got big grants to buy new machines, um, to hire more people, to train more people. So when I came um, to Germany in, uh, six years ago, I fell in love with this antique um, clutch that had a frame closure. And I suddenly was so inspired and I was like, I didn't really want to start another company. <laughs> But I was just so compelled by this construction that I thought I have so many ideas to create a line of bags around that idea. So I found out that this construction is a, a German heritage construction. So not having been in, in Germany or not having lived here for more than 30 years, I was like, I want to create like almost like an homage to Germany. I want to go out and research and make a product that is 100% German. And the research took over a year and was heartbreaking. I, um, I traveled to many artisan or you know, small manufacturing places who, whose prime was in the 1970s. Most of these companies were founded in the 1870s. And so 100 years later, the decline started. Nobody wanted to pay the prices for German-made products, so a lot got sourced out to Asia. And uh, I saw factory buildings that used to house more than 100 workers. And now there were three left, and they were all close to retiring age. And they said that, you know, we're happy to work with you, but there's nobody coming after us. The, the youth has no hope in learning the trade. Um, and um, after us, there's nothing left. So back to my question. Yeah. You, what you're just saying um, yeah. is there's a lot of support needed for these yeah. artisans, for, you know, there for is. new talents. Furthermore, there is because so when I decided to go ahead and, and create this, my line, Lutz Morris, um, I realized that friends in Italy get, uh, are giving a lot more supports to their artisans. There are n literally no supports in Germany for German artisans. And so I'm hoping that with our project, we create hope for young people to get into 
the business. And so what I managed is, is that nine, so I, I researched not only the making of the bags, but also the tanning of the leather, the, um, the chains, the hardware. And so now 95% of everything that goes into our bags comes from Germany. The rest comes from, then the other 5% come from Italy and Spain. But everything is sourced really closely. But, um, I mean, all this heart and soul that you put mm. into your product now um, also has its price. So consciousness mm -hmm. to work that way has mm -hmm. a price. So my question to you and after that maybe also to Jonas is um, can like a real, not sustainable, a real responsible product, um, can it live with Uh, outside the niche, really? Can sustainability, maybe you answer first and then you go ahead, Jonas, can sustainability ever be mainstream, really? I don't believe yet that that's possible because for me, the, the reason I don't like sustainability is because the moment you produce something, you're not sustainable. You're ultimately designing for the landfill. So what I, that's why I like responsibility because you have to be responsible every step along the way. And to your question, can sustainability, is it niche? I believe yes, because a big part for me, um, sustainability, a big part is who makes mm. your product and how is it made and where. So the moment um, you have... Um, A organic cotton t-shirt for 10 euros it's not in my eyes it's not sustainable because you know that the people who made it were not paid fairly and that it traveled of a long distance so you cannot have a fairly produced t-shirt for 10 euros from asia a sustainable t-shirt Jonas if she says no it can only truly live in the niche Yeah, well, I, I, as, as you mentioned in your introduction, um, I guess I'm a little bit more of an optimist. Um, <laughs> I, I do agree that, I mean, 100% sustainability is simply not possible and it should not be possible because sustainability is a constant journey of learning and pursuing um, the, 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 the best option. And I think as uh, we as we learn and as we continue to develop, there's always something more that can be improved. So that, you know, the essence of 100, being 100% sustainable, that's not possible, but that's different from maybe um, seeing it as becoming mainstream. I think we've come a long way um, on achieving this over the last 10 years, um, but we're definitely not there yet, that's for sure. I guess um, back in 2017, when we um, at Global Fashion Agenda created the first sort of pulse report to measure the overall sustainability performance of the industry, we learned that um, 50% of our industry um, had not yet started their sustainability journey. And so I think that's, that's probably changed and we've also come some way since then. Um, but I do think there's a number of, of great signs in increasing the efforts as an industry. Um, and if I can just highlight, I mean, the The, the, the HIG index, uh, the HIG index transparency program launch that happened um, just a, a little more than a month ago, back in May, um, I mean, now just that it's possible to publicly share the data about a product's environmental impact, um, of course, starting to focus on the materials content. I mean, this is a This is really a consistent way for brands, for retailers, for manufacturers to share sustainability information on the apparel and footwear products. This but, is a huge step. Okay, but Jonas, let me ask. I mean, there are many um, initiatives, many acts. There is the circular, circularity fashion commitment that you helped sign for many um, brands. But do the brands and companies, do they really live up to their commitments? Is this at all trackable um, these days? Or um, is, there, you know, is there still a lot of work to do? I mean, how do, you, um, how do you check, how do you monitor if they live up to their commitments? That you make them sign by talking to, pol to stakeholders and uh, politicians all day long? There's, there's definitely a lot to do still. Um, and 
um, the the the, uh, the initiative you mentioned, um, the 2020 uh, commitment that we also initiated in in 2017 in order for companies to set targets towards 2020. I mean, two thirds of the participants actually reached their targets. Um, that was based on self-assessment, yes. Um, so it's true that we need to take that a step further to make sure that it's also third party verified um, when we have self-assessment. And, you know, I mentioned the Higg Index before. I mean, this is uh, something that is uh, third, par third party verified. Um, what can we do in order to make this go faster? faster? I think it's, it's exactly um, that element around not just having third party uh, inclusion, but also to make sure that there is um, specifically involvement from the policymakers. I think that is really key to make sure that the policymakers also create uh, the right frameworks to make sure that we can actually track progress. And here, I mean, back to uh, looking at product environmental footprinting, um, it's so important to have a unified approach. Um, it's absolutely key when we're talking about measuring the impact of products. Um, I think policymakers have already come a long way on ensuring this. And, um, you know, you might have heard of the, of the work that the EU Commission is working on with the product environmental footprinting. Um, which is, again, this unified approach. I think that is where we need to go to create that unified and harmonized approach. What are the biggest roadblocks in your work when you talk to policymakers to get regulations aligned? And also for you, um, Katrin, what are your biggest roadblocks in your work? Maybe Jonas, you um, first and then quickly to Katrin. Well, I, I think actually uh, Luke from uh, Jill Center uh, put it uh, very, very nicely uh, just before in terms of um, mentioning how, um, how how much how difficult it is for them to work as a, you know, not a huge company, maybe a medium-sized company around transparency as really key um, to be able to overcome, not as a you know as a company alone but for the industry to work together because they don't have insights into their full supply chain. They need to rely on, on, on industry collaboration in order to uh, get to full transparency um, beyond uh, tier one and two and, and further into to the, um, to the supply chain. This is something where I think, again, the idea of working together as an industry is extremely important. Um, and it, it simply doesn't help a lot if we have national initiatives that go on their own, for example, um, creating new systems because we have maybe you know, a company like Jill Center or other larger companies working in a variety of uh, countries. And if, if, if each of those countries would have um, um, their own systems, to, uh, to report to, to uh, adhere to, it just wouldn't make life a lot easier. And so I think that's a key barrier to make sure that um, initiatives um, from policymakers are also um, harmonized and really rely. And that's where I think we're lucky in, in the European Union um, so far, at least, that we are looking towards that unified approach uh, with, with harmonized uh, initiatives. Well, maybe not around every issues, but um, I do think we're, we're, we're definitely uh, looking in the right direction. Here, yeah, um, Catherine, um, do you have to add anything from your point of view or, or would you on like- On roadblocks, certainly. I'd love to comment on some of the roadblocks. Um, <laughs> I think Marcus pointed out earlier that sustainability is a, is a journey and it's a long journey um, and you're never there 100%. And I think if you differentiate the different activities that you could implement, there are solutions that exist already now, switching to materials that are more sustainable, thinking of organic cotton, thinking of recycled polyester, implementing transparency and traceability solutions um, in the supply chain. Many of those solutions exist are available on the market 
but companies are still struggling um, to implement those because in some cases it's extremely complex, it costs more, etc. So that part of the journey is already challenging and entails quite some roadblocks. Where we are working on with Fashion for Good is the, the innovation side of things. So one step further into the future with innovators that have um, disruptive solutions on the raw material side or end of use solutions, chemical recycling, really the next frontier with um, a maturity stage that is still in the lab um, or still on the R&D journey. Could you Those challenges that we're facing there are um, fundamentally different because there it is about risk taking, it's about being willing to invest. So scarcity of financing is an important one and the ability to take risk and think of a long term horizon. There are solutions for that, but these are challenges and roadblocks that you're facing on the innovation side. Can you name one example? Because you are an innovation platform, you do lots of research for companies and you do a lot of research on materials especially. Maybe you can you know, make this a bit more concrete. Tell me about yeah. one new innovation that you have been invested in, that you did your research and now we have a new solution for a problem. Yeah, certainly. Well, maybe just to clarify, we're not researching. It's the um, innovators that we scout and screen throughout the world. And many of them are from Europe and from Germany and then bring onto the platform. It's a collaborative innovation platform where multiple brands and manufacturers are participating and then working with those innovator solutions. And the core idea here is that it's collaborative, means it's about spreading risk. It's about sharing costs. And it's about sharing learnings. So this consortium idea we've implemented in, in multiple setups. And the concrete example that I'd like to walk you through is, is polybags. Um, so polybags is the transparent packaging for every piece of garment. There are 180 billion produced every year. And the majority of those are following a linear journey. Only 15% of those polybags today are recycled, mostly because it's using the cutoffs in the, the pre-consumer cutoffs in the production journey. So the goal that we had together with um, our partner group was let's find a solution that is 100% circular. So taking post-consumer polybag waste, producing a process that allows to use this waste and have a clear um, quality um, level polybag again. So together with those partners, we found an innovator called Cadell de Inking in, um, in Spain. And we've shipped um, post-consumer um, polybag waste from the factories, from Otto, from DNA, from, from Adidas to this innovator. Tested this a couple of times and results were um, incredibly um, convincing, not only from a quality and price point perspective, but also from an LCA impact perspective. So one fifth of the impact of a um, new polybag is inherent in this um, recycled fully circular polybag. So after a year of assessing, testing, um, we're now in the phase of scaling. So the machines, those the inking machines are available at many of those larger um, polybag producers. And by now every brand can plug in to this supply chain and build on those um, fully circular polybags. That's one example that just builds on this idea. Thank you, Katrin. I, unfortunately, we have to come to an end, but I cannot end um, this panel because it's about fashion and sustainability and you all wear something today. So, Katrin, maybe you start. Uh, what are you wearing? How did you make the choice and why? Well, this lip dress here, I've discovered in a um, second-hand shop here in Amsterdam while cycling around the city. And um, yeah, it's a Victoria Beckham second-hand dress and I, I love it because it has these color pops and because it prolongs the lifetime of a garment, which is a key lever if you think of impact in the fashion industry. And Jonas, do you have something sustainable on you? Um. Well, this is a 10-year-old shirt. Uh, <laughs> it's still one of my favorite items. Um, I got this uh, when, I, when I started working with sustainability back in 2011. Uh, it's organic cotton, and it's, it's tailor-made, um, which, I mean, I'm a tall guy. I'm 192, 
Um, so I do not buy a lot of clothes, um, but I really want to make sure that it has the right fit uh, when I do. Um, and yes, it might actually, um, I might have to uh, save a little bit more money, put some more money aside to be able to, uh, to afford the tailor-made, not that all my clothes is tailor-made, but it's, um, I think it's, um, it's really great for shirts. I mean, again, back to the session before, um, Jill Sander was talking about the perfect shirt. Um, this is great because you can also even add a few details here and there when you get it uh, tailor-made and, Thank and you. be in charge. Thank you, Jonas. Just very briefly, it will be at bath time. Um, what are you wearing? I, my shirt and my jacket are more than 20 years old. Um, I believe in buy less, buy better. Um, this is an original Helmut Lang jacket that I bought in 1999 that has the perfect cut, the perfect fabric, um, perfect cool. made, shirt same. So, yes. So vintage is a solution yeah. for you as well? Well, I guess I'm more of a normal consumer. So it's, does it fit? How does it feel? Do I like to wear it? And, and have, the course, have the workers been treated fairly, of course? Have the workers been treated fairly? So that's like a, something in my neck all the time that I think, okay, I like this product, you know, but I have to ask the people that are selling it, were the per uh, people right. paid fairly or not? So it's always a mix, basically. I try to follow that, but sometimes I see something and I think, okay, I will still get it. So I'm not perfect, I must admit. Well, I think the system is neither and neither of us is. Thank you all for participating in this panel.